So I didn't start out just trying to write a book called Seasick, which is what it ended up to be. I actually started out writing a book called The Deeps, <laughs> which was really just to try to figure out what the ocean is, what it means to the planet. And it evolved into Seasick when I realized how we're damaging the major life support system of the planet. So here's what I learned. The ocean contains 99% of the living space on the planet. There's only one ocean. It's all connected. It's all one big system. And it controls our climate. It controls most of our oxygen. It controls our carbon cycle. It controls nitrogen. It is, in fact, the life support system of the whole planet. So as one scientist put it to me, if everything on land were to die tomorrow, everything in the ocean would be just fine. But if the opposite happened, if everything in the ocean were to die tomorrow, everything on land would also die. So it keeps us alive. In fact, for most of the planet's existence, there has been life only in the ocean. Every second breath you breathe of oxygen comes from plankton in the ocean. And about a third of that ancient carbon that we're digging up has been absorbed into the global ocean, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually an enormous, enormous amount. But when the carbon dioxide gets into the, the ocean, it actually changes the chemistry of the ocean. So this is what's known as ocean acidification. The pH of the global ocean is lower now than it's been at, at, since for about 55 million years. Creatures that live in the ocean are gradually being disconnected from their own evolutionary history. So the chemistry of the ocean that gives them life, and in fact gives us life by default, has been changed and is changing so that it's going to be different from the chemistry that they evolved in. And the, potential implications of this are enormous. It's not even on our political agenda. I was up at, in Ottawa last week talking with the uh, department with the Minister of Fisheries and Oceans, and this was news. This is like this is not something that, it, that people in that department are fluent with. It's, it's something different. So when we're talking about, for example, what's going to happen after the Kyoto Protocol, or what, you know, what is the Obama administration going to do to lower emissions of carbon dioxide, the implications of carbon dioxide on the global ocean are not part of that discussion, which is an issue. It's a big issue. And that's not the only problem there. You know, we all know about the fish, we all know about the big dead zones where there's no oxygen in the ocean. And there are a whole bunch of different issues to do with the global ocean, which I talk about in my book. And in effect, the, the, the principle is that they're greater than the sum of their parts. We're affecting the global ocean in ways that are unprecedented in human history and <coughs> many, many millions of years on the planet. So um, I got pretty depressed about this. I thought, you know, this is, <laughs> this is a, a saddish thing. And uh, I, in fact, I got to the very end of the research for this book, the very last journey for this book, and I had decided that I wanted to go down into the ocean in a submersible. And this is really hard to do. You don't just sort of, you know, dial up Expedia and book one of these things. There are only a couple of dozen on the planet that even go, uh, you know, submersibles. And usually you have to be either military or business or, or, um, or potentially an academic to go on one of these things. So finally we get to the bottom and it's 3,000 feet. And this is part of the planet that no one, no humans have ever seen before. And it's quite clear to me that, no, you know, maybe no one ever will see it again. We are the only four people in the planet who have ever seen this. And somehow talked to me about the nature of hope. And I realized somehow in this epiphany at the very bottom that it, it's not about convincing yourself to hope, it's about deciding to hope. Monica Sharma, a physician who works with the United Nations, delves deep into the human psyche to shift behavior on other seemingly intractable problems. So her view is that for transformation to happen, we first need to understand that transformation is possible. And for that to happen, we need to strip ourselves psychologically naked and figure out what each of us stands for. What is it that we believe? What are we here for? So here's my question at the end of this journey. What do you stand for? What story do you tell yourself about why you're here? Perhaps you are a hero. It's clear the world needs heroes right now to ask what's missing and how that can be made right. I don't know exactly how the heroes will gather. But I know that if enough people are asking the right questions, we can make a start. This is a call for wisdom, not for logic. For hope rather than despair. It is about taking a stand and then acting on it, being fully human at a time when the planet needs it the most. Many of the scientists I interviewed talked about the time frame of 2015 to 2030 as the drop dead point for action that is effective for halting the planet's course toward chaos. If you believe that this matters and that something can be done, and the rest of the story means that the time to act is right now. Thank you.